session. There it goes. Worked. Okay. So Mary Pearl is back in um, as me. <laughs> It never seems to fail um, that we test all the things and then something always seems to just shake you up right at the start. Um, so I appreciate everybody's patience as we worked through that. Um, we are now recording um, and we're going to get started with our team and Tuesday event and I'm going to try and um, speed us along so that we um, give Nate the full amount of time that he is due for his presentation today. So I'm going to give a quick um, tech check for everybody who is joining our presentation for the first time. Um, if you've joined previous TMN Tuesday events, you have seen this before, but we want to kind of set the stage and make sure that everybody's on the same um, level with technology. If you are a new attendee, do not worry on this WebEx event. You cannot unmute or share your video, and that is on purpose. We typically have um, a, up to a thousand attendees on our conference. Um, lines. So um, we appreciate your patience through that, but we do have some portals for you to be able to communicate and, uh, and network with other master naturalists on the line and with our speaker today. Um, but first, if you have now seen all of this movement, um, seen the screen sharing, seen Michelle and I move our mouths, but have not been able to hear us, you want to be able to check your audio. Um, and so take a, a quick screenshot. You can't hear me, so you can't hear me telling you to take a quick screenshot. Um, but hopefully this will, this screen is helping you troubleshoot that right now. Going to that audio settings, um, getting your speakers turned on, plugged in, um, if they're not plugged in, and I'm um, getting your, um, your audio connected for today. Um, so hopefully that has brought everybody up on board um, if they were not able to hear us previously. All right, and then for everybody else who um, is joining our TMN Tuesday event, um, again, not able to unmute or able to share your video, but we are enabling the chat function today. The chat function will be your platform for communicating with Michelle and myself, communicating with Nate, our presenter today, um, asking questions. We do ask that all questions are in clear and full sentences. Avoid acronyms so that Michelle and I can help moderate those questions appropriately for Nate when it's time for those discussion points. Um, and again, the best uh, grammar and spelling helps us to make sure that we're understanding what you're asking and we can get you the best answer from Nate possible. Um, also to make sure that everybody is seeing your questions um, and that all eyes are able to, to share on these um, kind of joint inquiries, uh, make sure that you toggle that chat to to everyone so that everyone is able to speak together. All right, and then finally, if you are still having WebEx issues, um, there's always a helpline. There is a FAQs page. It's a great resource for um, any additional uh, troubleshooting that you may have. Michelle, do you want to kick us off and introduce the Texas Master Naturalist program and TMN Tuesday concept? Yep. So um, as we mentioned, when everybody was getting on and we were figuring out our tech troubles, um, we have Nate Fuller with Texas Parks and Wildlife here today to talk about uh, bats and bat conservation in Texas. Um, this is part of our TMN Tuesdays event. We have two left for uh, the remainder of the year. Today is November 9th, which is Nate in Bats in Texas. And upcoming December 14th is our next one for our TMN Tuesdays. Each these Our TMN Tuesdays are held on the second Tuesday of each month at 12 p.m. Central Time. Um, and this is where our state Texas Master Naturalist Program Office offers advanced training events um, through our TMN Tuesdays efforts. Um, the events are free and open to the public. We record them. Um, they are advanced training for the time that we're, we're live um, during the session. So any of our Master Naturalists and public can attend. Our Master Naturalists can obtain advanced training for the time that they um, either watch us live or if they can't tune in live, um, our Master Naturalists can watch the recordings of our TMN Tuesdays for advanced training credit as well. Next slide. They're giving us a leg. <laughs> All right. Um, 
if you're new to the Master Naturalist program, you're not and you haven't yet joined us, um, but you're interested in joining us, we always welcome you. Um, you can find all of our information to locate the chapter nearest you and their upcoming trainings is on our website. And I'm going to scroll through this stuff really fast. The next one, um, there's our website, TMN Tuesdays, our next, uh, November 9th is today. Our next one coming up, give a plug for that, is December, um, actually it's not the 7th, it's the 14th. Um, it's the second Tuesday of every month. It is R3, Recruit, Retain, and Reactivate. And then um, we will have TMN Tuesdays in 2021. We have not set the dates for those yet um, in the frequency. A little bit of our etiquette, um, use the chat box. We, we've run through some of this, but use the chat box to ask questions, um, keep it on topic, um, professional, and um, uh, minimize the use of acronyms so we can help relay and mo um, um, moderate that session, that question back with Nate. Um, we anticipate the session running about an hour. Um, and as I mentioned, the recordings are available. They will be re available on our website um, by the end of the following day. You can find them here on our website. Um, the recording for today's will be there and we'll also send a note out that that's available too. So without much further ado, I want to introduce Nate Fuller. Nate is a bat biologist, our bat biologist, our, our one and only main bat biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, many of you may have, if you've tuned in for our Winter Storm, Storm URI um, webinar event in uh, March, I believe it was, March or April, um, you saw Nate present with us there. And um, he's back by popular demand with a, a even more focus on Texas bats. Um, bat, uh, uh, Nate, as I mentioned, is currently the lead bat biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. His main responsibility is to guide the state's response to white nose syndrome, a fungal disease of hibernating bats. His research focuses on the impacts of disease on host physiology and behavior and how host traits influence disease outcomes. Um, more broadly, his work examines the mechanisms that dictate energy expenditure decisions in mammals and how animal physiology can be used as a, as a tool for conservation. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Nate, to tell us more about bats in Texas um, and how uh, we can help. Okay, sounds good to me. You hear me? Does everyone, I hear the seeing in the chat that people are having some volume issues. Am I speaking loudly enough for you? Sweet, okay. Wonderful. All right, now we're gonna go through this process of learning how to, relearning how to share a screen. And I want to, there's that. And then we hit F5 and we have the wrong one. <laughs> And so we do the swappy swap and everything's good. Looks good. <laughs> right on. Okay. Well, um, I uh, thank you everybody for attending and thank you for uh, inviting me to do this talk. I want to open by saying that uh, I love the master naturalist. I know that's one of those things. Like if you're like, you go to a concert and they're like, we love you Cleveland. I actually mean it, you know, you, this is the organization that uh, that you guys have built is really fascinating. It's really dynamic. I love the passion that the group uh, that the, everyone in the group has um, has for nature, for the outdoors, and you really do facilitate. You help to facilitate the kinds of stuff that Parks and Wildlife really depends on. It being a private land state, Texas being a private land state, we have issues with access with uh with uh, uh accessing lands and and documenting where animals are so having a passionate group of people around to help us solve some of those issues is really fantastic so there you have it um this is uh i just take a quick moment to introduce myself i'm the one on the left in this picture <laughs> as you can probably tell um this is my friend Kirk and I, we're in uh, Montana, and that's when I work for uh, Texas Tech University, as you can see written on the side of the, of the trailer. I, uh, my background is in physiology. I'm a, um, uh, oh, you can't see my mouse, excellent. Uh, my, my background's in, in hibernation physiology, bat ecology, white nose syndrome. 
this project was a project in which we were doing uh, hibernation physiology work on bats all across the western United States. So we would drive from Lubbock all the way up to Montana and go to places in between. So we had field sites in Oregon and Colorado, Nevada, and, and Utah. And we would put bats inside of some complicated physiological equipment inside and measure things. And so I come to Texas through a circuitous path of going to grad school in Boston, did a PhD there, and then did uh, my postdoc at Texas Tech, and then I found my way to Parks and Wildlife because I'm a white nose syndrome researcher, and one of the biggest challenges that Texas face, Texas faces, and not all states in, the, in, in America face right now is white nose syndrome and how we deal with it. And it's a very big topic and it's a very impenetrable topic. So, um, you know, it's it's a uh, what this leads into is the beginning of my is the beginning of my talk where I have this from your Hamlet if you remember the famous soliloquy where he says whether it is nobler to nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows and blah 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 or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them and. The reason why I bring this up is that there's this concept in our in our world in white nose syndrome research that's called white nose syndrome syndrome, where you've been working on a very big, very difficult, almost unsolvable problem for a very long part of your career, and uh, you feel like Hamlet going up against a sea of troubles, where you imagine there's a tsunami coming, and you're armed there with some darts, and you can throw darts at that tsunami and feel like you're making a change. And the the work that we do is very difficult and the work that we do is very mentally draining because you know we get to see in cases where there used to be lots of healthy bats around, we see an environment that looks like this. This is a normal roosting cluster of bats in a cave. I think these are from Texas or could be somewhere else. And over time, we get to see things like this where the bats fall down from, they suffer from white nose syndrome, they die, and they turn into these little puddles of what was once a bat on the bottom of a floor of a cave. And so, um, I'm bringing this up just to, just to, you know, we start out a little bit morbid, and I just want to say that the work that we do is inherently not very positive. But what's cool about it is we can find ways to feel good about the work that we do, and we can find ways to achieve things that couldn't be done otherwise. And so uh, it's there's difficulty out there, but we we keep going and we keep working. And organizations like Parks and Wildlife and other wildlife organizations on the uh, in the United States really um, are doing are doing our very best to make things happen. Um, I got a message here that somebody can't see my slides. Is that something that is happening across the board? Are we okay? Is it a, a single issue? Yeah, Nate, with your double participant, I moved your your face video to okay. stage so okay. folks can use the, the layout toggle in their top right to see full screen if they're not able to see both your slides and your face at the same time. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, so I confuse people. All right. Um, Maybe type those instructions in there too, so that might help. But, okay. anyway. anyway, so all I'm talking about here is that uh, we have challenges, we have grand challenges that we face, and it's not a unique Texas thing, but it's something that we think about. And so let's start off by talking about why bats are important. So there are 34 species of bats in Texas, including insecti insectivores and nectar feeding bats. Some may say there are 35 species of bats. It depends on if there's a storm that came through. It depends on what you define as a residential species of bat. We have 30-ish species of bat. Doesn't matter the number. It's actually, but we can say that we have the most diversity of bats in the United States. Uh, bats are long-lived. They have a very slow reproductive rate, which makes them a challenge to 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 conserve. It's not like a mouse that has six litters you know, over a lifetime of uh, six litters of six pups over a lifetime of three years, bats have one pup a year, maybe two. Uh, some species will have two pups, but they're very slow to reproduce, which means that the impacts that they face, population impacts have a long-term impact, or, <clears throat> excuse me, have a long-term impact on general population uh, numbers. Bats have a large, uh, yes, I did. I worked with Tom Coons. <laughs> 
Yeah, he was my PhD advisor. That's really awesome. Uh, bats have a large economic impact. They consume crop, uh, crop pests. They save farmers billions, billions with a B of dollars each year in uh, safe pesticide costs. Uh, they're uh, pollinators of native vegetation, and they're also indicators of ecosystem health, sort of the canary in the coal mine, if you want to say that. And so let's just sort of break right now into the into the threats to bats. And there's some things that I won't be able to dive into in very deep, much detail um, during this talk, and we can talk about it in questions if you'd like to. One of the things that we uh, bat researchers are really challenged with right now is uh, wind turbines and wind power. Green energy is a big movement right now, and wind turbines are common in Texas, and they're about to become far more common. And you probably very well know that uh, wind turbines kill large numbers of bats, and particularly the migratory tree bats. And so you can see down here, this is what we call the, this is the hoary bat who's been thwacked by a, a wind turbine. And population estimates and modeling suggest that uh, the populations of these bats are plummeting, and there is some momentum for these bats to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. If, they, if these bats gain listed status, there will be lots of heavy regulatory impacts on energy regeneration. And so this is going to have a big impact on things like green energy production and uh, expansion of, of um, carbon expansion of, of energy production uh, techniques that use that produce less carbon. So there are global implica implications for the fact that bats are getting killed by wind turbines. Uh, if you read some of the headlines, uh, as I said, migratory tree bats are heavily impacted by it. Um, there was a paper that came out not too long ago that said 600,000 bats killed by wind turbines in 2012, something like that. Basically, it breaks down to look like this. This is a figure from that paper. And if there's a couple of things I want to highlight here, this is the lower, lower the, the the range of impact that uh, could be that could be happening based on the modeling efforts. And a few highlights I want to bring out there. These are the migratory tree bats, and there are some big time hits that you see in these populations. Hoary bats, in particular. We're looking at something like 633,000 is the high estimate of of uh, is the high estimate uh, on this on this paper. But there's also other ones down down here too. These are not migratory tree bats, but they're still very. These bats are heavily impacted by white nose syndrome. The little brown bat, 106,000. Again, one puppy year. They can't recover from this stuff very well. Tricolor bat. This bat is potentially about to be listed in the Endangered Species Act. They're very common in Texas, or at least they were. And so uh, we're looking at some big impacts here that are difficult, <laughs> difficult, I don't want to say impossible, but very difficult to deal with because there are balancing acts that we have to do. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about wind turbines because I have lots of other things to talk about, but suffice to say that uh, it appears that bats are attracted to wind turbines, which is one of the reasons why they get killed by, by uh, the turbine blades so effectively. So lots of people are working on strategies like deterrence or uh, smart mitigation, or I'm sorry, smart curtailment to reduce the impacts on bats, but I wonder if we'll ever really have a handle on this. Okay, uh, we also are dealing with uh, climate change in the state. Uh, Texas is a state that's it's going to be hit by climate change a little more hard than many of the other states because of rampant desertification and losing our water and long-term droughts. And droughts have a big impact, not so much on the bats, because bats can find water. Uh, they, bats are heavily dependent on insect populations, and they do get a lot of water from insects, but they also get all their food from insects. And so if bugs are out of sync and bugs are impacted, then bats are going to be impacted. And this kind of leads into this concept of what's a, a phenological shift, which means that a changing environment can tri trigger animal movements that are out of sync with movements or behaviors or whatever, they're out of sync with ecological patterns. So in this case up here, um, you have a match that was driven by evolution over time in which a, a breeding bird will lay its eggs during the warmest part of the year, that's what this is meant to signify, and uh, the chicks will be out during the peak of caterpillar season. Sounds great. But when there is a phenological mismatch, the warm, warmest part of the year happens earlier, then the chicks come out earlier and they won't be able to hit the peak caterpillar season. So this kind of stuff uh, impacts, impacts breeding, 
impacts migratory patterns and in the case of bats, it will also impact uh, hibernation patterns. And we saw something like this, if you were on the, the, the URI talk earlier or last year or whenever that was, this is what we think, this is what I think has happened, that the bats came back a bit too early, there was a hard freeze, and we had lots and lots of mortality. And it was very, very sad. And this kind of builds into this ecological track concept where these animals have a high preference for a low quality habitat. So these bridges, yeah, I mean, they're great for the sake of being relatively good habitat, but uh, because they have low parasite loads, they're low crowding, that means they have low stress, but they're exposed and they're responsive to environmental conditions, they're thermally unstable. And so when you have challenges like uh, when you have challenges like this freeze that comes in and hits bats that came back too early, they can't survive that event. And you have, you know, what we witnessed of 50,000 dead bats, at least across the state. <clears throat> okay. And then the biggest challenge, which is my job mostly, and the challenge that a lot of bat researchers are working on right now is white nose syndrome, which is an emerging infectious disease. So this is a uh, this is a, a cutaneous fungal disease caused by the novel pathogen Pseudogymnoascus destructans. I won't say that from here on out. We'll call it PD. It was first observed in 2006 up in the New York State. It's extremely vir extremely virulent, and uh, we think we believe it's an invasive pathogen from Eurasia. Somehow, either a bat or a dirty boots or a human moved the move the pathogen to North America, it was exposed to naive hosts and it has run rampant over the past 15 years or so. Started in New York, has moved up into Canada, down into Texas, uh, and it's now sort of edging into uh, New Mexico. It's already jumped over to California and Washington. It's basically all across the continent right now. But there's also really cool uh, sort of funny um, uh, conspiracy theories, I'll call them, about where white nose could have come from. Some people say that Monsanto developed it because it would help them uh, help them increase their profits on on pesticide use because the bats no longer control bug populations. Uh, there's an idea that French soil from a French cave was brought over to North America so that we could have a French cheese, a French cave cheese. Uh, environment. You know, they age cheese in caves, but it all depends on the microbes that are in the environment. So bring the soil over, dump it, age your cheese in the cave, and you'll have American-made French cheese. But if you bring a bunch of soil over, it can bring pathogens and all that stuff. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying that there's lots of ideas out there. Most likely it was just it hitchhiked or a bat found its way to America and, and brought it over. Uh, the severe, uh, several species are very heavily impacted. We've got something like 90% mortality at many sites or even more. Uh, models suggest that local extinctions could be likely. It's This is a bit of a, it's an, so it's kind of an old paper. Um, it's possible that um, this assertion is no longer correct. We're seeing that in a lot of places where white nose has been for a long time, bats are resilient and they're sticking around. So at very small numbers, we've taken sites that were once 300,000 animals and were down to 3,000 animals, but there's still animals there and it's still a place for natural selection and evolution to take role, take a, take a role. Um, and our overall declines will vary by species. So little brown bats have been affected very heavily, tricolored bats, but big brown bats seem to be okay. Well, bet, relatively okay. Um, the uh, west, uh, sorry, eastern small-footed bat is, seems to be generally okay. And when I say okay, that means their declines are far less than these dramatic ones that we're talking about. And I'm just going to illustrate that with this point here. You know, over time, it's kind of a spaghetti graph, but you can see there's this general trend of increase uh, during these surveys all the way up to the point of white nose hitting. And then suddenly there was this massive decline almost past, like you see some of these sites were, were zero uh, during these surveys. Like I said, some of these sites are still around. There may be some hints of a recovery, but I, I kind of doubt that we're looking at, um, I kind of doubt that we're looking at a recovery, just sort of a reorganization of the colonies. All right, so what causes mortality? And this is, you know, when we talk about, when we do advanced trainings, I like to sh kind of shove a bunch of physiology at people because it's my, it's my background. 
um, and you know, trains you. <laughs> so one thing I want to point out to people is that hibernation is not a static event. It's not a static event for bats, for ground squirrels, for marmots, for bears, even though it's arguable that bears hibernate. No animal hibernates in the same, in the way that, that popular culture would have you believe. Puxatani Phil does not go down. Puxatani Phil, I don't know if, I'm from Pennsylvania. Puxatani Phil is the famous groundhog that's used in Groundhog Day to say, oh, there, he's got his shadow. Puxatani Phil does not go to bed in November, fall asleep for six months, and then wake up in March or whenever the, I can't do the math, but uh, <laughs> the, what happens is that hibernation is, is a behavior and it's punctuated by uh, these periodic arousals from cold body temperature to warm body temperature. Thank you, February 2nd. And so uh, I, have this, I have this body temperature trace down here. This is a, an eye button, a, a temperature sensor that's been glued to the back of a bat. And this line is its body temperature. So you see the body temperature mainly stays really low for these like two week periods. And then they're punctuated by these big increases to normal body temperature. And there is, this is regular behavior across the board. Ground squirrels do this, marmots do this. Like I said, there's only one case of hibernation that does not exhibit this. And it's a tenrec from Madagascar that uh, was trying to hibernate in a very warm environment. So there's, th there's thinking that that warm environment, the fact that metabolic rate wasn't suppressed so low, uh, avoided some of the physiological stresses that come with having body temperature that stays this low. There's, there is a cost to dropping your body temperature like that. They don't actually sleep, so they have sleep deprivation. They build up free radicals. They build up urine. They build up uh, other toxins that they have to arouse and clear it out or take a drink or things like that. So anyway, um, the, the, the arousals will account for 1% of the total time spent hibernating, but 90% of the total energy expenditure. So a six gram bat uses most of that energy during these, during these periodic arousals. And what happens in white nose syndrome is you usually have these periods that are nice two week long periods of bats stay down for a long time, save a lot of energy. But near the end of hibernation, once the fungus has really started to grow on the bat, like you see in this picture here, it starts eating away at the wing, wing membranes and through a complicated physiological mechanism, it causes them to arouse more often from hibernation and they rip through their fat way too fast. And usually sometime around February, March, they're out on the landscape dying in the snow because they're more or less starving to death. And so this won't be on the test, but basically what this is is a flow chart of what causes mortality. You have your infection and wing damage. It leads to increased evaporative water loss because they've got holes in their wings and water can just escape from their body. They uh, arouse to drink unenriched water. So it's like if you were dehydrated and you drank just water instead of Gatorade, that gives you what's called hypotonic dehydration. You don't have enough salts in your body. That increases arousal frequency, which means you have an increased metabolic rate. This also is happening at the same time where you have increased respiration rate due to stress and due to uh, 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 wing damage. That increases CO2 saturation, which makes your blood more acidic. It's called acidosis. And that increases your metabolic rate. It causes your body, uh, your, your fat stores to be uh, lose, you lose your fat stores too quickly and eventually you die from starvation. Of course, there is some positive news. Not all bats die from starvation. You do have some that will emerge from hibernation and recover. However, it doesn't mean that they're not damaged. They come out, their wings are all tattered. They don't, they, uh, don't exhibit the same sort of, uh, thermoregulatory strategy after hibernation. It's a very rough time. And this is also combined with the fact that they're about to start having, uh, they're about to start uh, developing their embryo. They're trying to, they're going to grow their pup. They're uh, trying to deal with the environment being unfavorable to foraging. So it's a very energetically challenging time. Uh, in Texas, we have had um, a development of white nose syndrome happen very quick. And now we're sort of waiting to see what the next thing is going to be. We got reports of dead bats in March of 2020. Uh, we got a significant mortality of developer across central Texas. 
we had 18 counties with mortality and 20 of them currently we have 18 counties with mortality which are mostly in the central texas area and 20 with confirmed disease which last year we confirmed caves up in this area that have disease and we noticed that the the, vi uh, the virus Wow, the fungus is starting to spread. It was just found in Presidio. It's very likely in Brewster. There are counties right up here in New Mexico that have it. I imagine white nose is across the state. We just don't know where to find it. Um, this, this map has actually been generated because people like you have been out there reporting bats on the ground in distressed conditions. And so uh, this is one of those things that we would not have had success in knowing where white nose was if it weren't for citizen scientists and people who are passionate. Um, overall, the impact has been pretty rough. Some colonies have vanished completely, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so this sort of leads us towards, um, so there's, there's generally what the threats are. We can talk about, I see you have some questions about wind turbines and stuff. We can talk about that at the question period and, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can, we can answer there. But in general, we have all of these threats that I'm, that I'm talking about, and that leads me to, uh, sort of explain what I do with my job every day and what I think about. And what I think about are sort of research questions. How can we best spend uh, federal money? Whoops, whoops, ooh, there we go. How can we best spend federal money that uh, in a way to, um, to allocate funding toward conservation practices? And so I wanna ask a series of questions. That's how you start out the scientific, the scientific method. Uh, so, one big question we have is what are the seasonal trends of bad activity in the state? Uh, we really want to know what the impacts of white nose syndrome are. Uh, and then we need to also evaluate. I mean, we're, I'm in the business of conservation. So we really need to evaluate ways we can slow or stop population declines. Uh, and can we do that with innovation? I hope I don't suddenly have a timer set on my slides because things are bouncing without me telling them to. So this will be interesting if that's the case. <laughs> okay. so. Um, as I said, uh, there are these questions right here, and this is sort of going to be the framework as we go forward. And we'll start out with the question of where are the bats? And here's an example that I just want to talk about. I mean, it's basically very difficult, if not impossible, to develop conservation efforts without first understanding our seasonal population trends. And just to make it very simple, yeah, somehow there's a timer, cool. To make it very simple, we are uh, looking at um, Tadera brasiliensis, the, the uh, Mexican free tail bat, the one that's very common in the state, one we know a lot about. And I just want to show this slide to, to, to give you an example of like, hey, their, their lifestyle is actually rather uh, complicated. They're not always around. They move around a lot. They overwinter somewhere. They have their pups somewhere. They nurse throughout a period right here. The pups are weaned and bowling around this point. They have to migrate away. They overwinter again. And the bats are moving around constantly different. Like males are going different directions. Pups are going in different directions. Females that don't have a pup versus females that do have a pup. We need to understand all of these seasonal patterns. And I'll tell you one thing, it's not the same for every species of bat. To Derrida, we actually have a really good idea of where they go. There's studies been done. These banding studies have been done where people have tracked bats from California down to uh, Jalisco. Bats have tr people have tracked bats from Central Texas all the way down uh, to I don't know what we got Hidalgo down here. So this is cool because this is an example of an accessible species that we can learn that we can have answers to. Uh, answers to some of the questions about how they move around, but very few of our species of bats do we have anywhere close to that information. So how do we even address, address this question? Well, we can do in-person surveys, and the way we do that is do what you see me doing right here. You follow the karst, and you go into caves and you look for bats, usually in the wintertime, sometimes in the summertime, depending on the species. And uh, the thing here, though, is that it's a time-consuming, expensive, and dangerous process uh, that requires staff time to go in the caves and look around and you know this is all based on you have to base your timing on what people can do and what the timing of the efforts are and there's lots of places in the state that bats can go cave or cave like things this is a culvert in east texas this that is absolutely filled with bats this is from a cave in the panhandle that's filled with bats you have to try to do these statewide surveys to get a picture of where the bats are. And we've done some effort with this. This is uh, an example of 
a lot of the sites that we visited on this Google Earth picture that I've put down. And so these statewide efforts have been done with uh, a and and Texas Tech. We've got cave bridge culvert surveys and new efforts coming up where we're going to focus specifically on this area of the state right here, looking in highway culverts for this guy, which is the tricolor bat, which is a species of bat that is um, undergoing petitioning and perhaps can, uh, uh, listing from the Endangered Species Act. So stay tuned on that. We're trying to find a lot more colonies of them in East Texas. So if anyone knows anything about bats or caves in that part of the state, we would love to hear about it. Other efforts that we can undertake uh, include passive monitoring approaches. So uh, we don't actually have to go out there and physically handle the bat, physically be in presence of the bat. We can actually understand uh, bat phenology, migratory movements, and white nose syndrome impacts using acoustic monitoring. And this plays into the North American Bat Monitoring Program. The North American Bat Monitoring Program is a uh, large sort of open source network of bat bat acoustic uh, sensors that people are putting out all over the country to sort of populate this um, populate this uh, model for uh, trends and movements and that kind of thing. And so we have a project with Texas State University. This is my friend Eli Lee setting up a detector by a, a pond over there. And of course, an embarrassing photo because that's what bat, pe bat people do to each other. But this, this project we have going all over the state right now um, and I don't know, maybe some of you are even participating in it. There are bats in East Texas. There are bats all over Texas. It's just the, the question is more about which species are out there. So um, here's a little bit of detail about what the North American Bat Monitoring Program is, NABAT. So what you can do, they have this cool platform. Oh, okay, let's go back a little bit. What they've done is they've gridded out the entire North American continent. And in these grids, these randomly assigned grids, they have a priority listing. And so within that priority, people want detectors put down. And so we, we align ourselves by priority and we put detectors in these spots and we record the bat movements. And then all that data get pushed up into this, uh, the federal program in which uh, you can then go on this platform and, and go to, uh, you can go into this platform, find your cell, and put in your information and uh, and do um, uh, do basically help look for what species bats and what their patterns are in your area. So this layer, all I did was search for National Park Service. What has their survey effort been? And so all these uh, all these national parks have done these survey efforts, including some ones in Canada, I guess. No, that probably is still Minnesota, and. Uh, and if you look for, uh, you can do a sort of summary survey of this where, you know, here's the activity of, of animals. Here's the animals that we're looking for. These are all four letter abbreviations, Lazarus, Borealis, Lazarus, Cenarius. And in the grid cells, you can see how many animals were in these spots or how likely it was to see an animal in, in, these, in these grid cells. And we'll move forward, like you can even, I, I sort of narrowed this down, sorry, ignore those, uh, those, uh, let's see, can I clear? Don't worry about, it. ignore these circles right here. Um, so I just zoomed in on what Grand Teton has done. And if you look at this picture, you can look, you can see the, the uh, grid cells by date. You can see the sampling effort that people have done uh, across across these these properties. And from there, you can pull out information about like, when are the bats there? What kind of bats are there? And that kind of thing. This all goes up into a big monitoring network. And so it's going to have a lot of power. In our context, we have, uh, this is the, the grid in Texas. Ignore this right here, there we are. This is the grid system in Texas that Texas State is working off of. Um, so all of these grids will get detectors in them. If we zoom in just around Bear County. This is what it looks like in in San Antonio. So we have a detector running in. We have detectors running in this cell for sure. One is somewhere over here, and one is somewhere over here in Government Canyon. So any bat could be a very po powerful thing. Uh, and the next steps we have for this is I've requested some funding to launch a citizen science version of any bat within. 
just Texas, uh, taking advantage of the Master Naturalist Network. Now, I know there's a bunch of people on this call and everyone's about to get really excited. I just want to make sure that you know that we're not there yet. I only have enough money to buy a limited amount of a limited number of detectors and there it's going to take time for this process to, to gear up. But my goal is to develop a statewide network of researchers and enthusiasts and uh, build a detector library so that we can loan these out to the master naturalist chapters, or you guys can buy your own and participate in a bat without even dealing with parks and wildlife. It's totally possible. I encourage you to go on the NABAT website and dig around and see what you guys can do. It's actually rather affordable uh, if people pool their money for software and uh, and detectors. Okay, um, so what else are we going to talk about here? So that's how do you generally answer the question where bats are? And now we're gonna launch into a case study of uh, Myotis velifer and how we're doing our research on this species of bat that is heavily impacted by white nose syndrome. At one point, this was most likely our second most common species of bats in Texas. It's a cave obligate, almost exclusively is inside of caves and cave-like habitats, and it's heavily impacted by white nose syndrome. And why do I say that? Well, when we did research this summer, I got some money, I got a, a, a field, a temporary field hire to go out to sites with a camera and record emergences and count the number of bats coming out of them and compare those to some historical estimates that we've had. Uh, it looks like we've had populations crashing hard since that first event where white nose syndrome came through. Um, and here are the numbers, basically 70%, 80%, 70%. It doesn't look very promising for this species of bat. Um, many more unknown populations could have suffered worse declines. We have even a couple of records of populations completely vanishing. Ones that have been there for years, thousands of bats are now gone. So we really had to, when this happened, we had to change our gears really hard and focus hard on, on Velifer. And one of the problems that we're facing here is that our thinking about what are these common species of bats really needs to be modernized. We don't know where the colonies are. We don't know where the bats are moving around and on what time scales, and we don't know anything about their population structure. This old account from 1970 suggests there are three subspecies of Velifer that live in the north in North America. Divisions like this right here and divisions like this right here, which are absolutely passable by any individual bat during any migratory period, are completely imaginary in my mind. This is not biologically relevant. This is not something that's helpful. And I think that we really need to understand more in depth how bats are moving across the landscape and sharing genes and sharing pathogens we'll say it that way, from one population to another. Are these northern bats uh, as, going to be as heavily affected by whiteness syndrome? Well, it depends on where it comes from and it depends on their habitat. What are the differences between these groups? And you know, these are some of the questions that we're pursuing right now. So how do we resolve this? Well, right now we've funded a project through the University of Montana that's going to do uh, landscape sampling of bat roosts and, uh, and bat specimens. So existing bat specimens that are, that are in museums and things that we've submitted as part of mortality surveys uh, are going to be used in this project. And we're also gonna be using some non-lethal techniques to conduct, uh, con conduct genomic analysis. So basically I take a bit of skin and I put it into this tube and we send it off, my back, there we go. <laughs> And we send it off to genomics facilities and they can do population genomics work. You get a full genome out of these animals and you can do lots of really cool comparative work that uh, those data can then be used to predict potential outcomes. So this group is going to do ecological niche monitoring, I'm sorry, modeling, predict where bats are or examine where bats are. Uh, and then they're going to take the genotyping approach and look for uh, climate adapted gene expression white nose syndrome resistance potentially, uh, and I'm not sure what LG analysis means, but basically all of this information will tell us where the bats are, how they're moving around, uh, are there distinct populations, and then that goes into the simulation modeling that will, that will help Parks and Wildlife understand, okay, if we intervene in this, at this level, will that do anything for the bats? If we intervene at this level, will it do negative things for the bats? All very important stuff that we just don't have a handle on right now. So this helps go into our decision making. We are also doing a, a project with Bat Conservation International 
uh, in which we're capturing bets at uh, roost. We're marking them with pit tags. Pit tags are basically the, the chip that you put in your dog or cat, and uh, you can scan it and get an individual mark of, of what animal, you get an individual ID of an animal, and, uh, and you get 24-7, 365 monitoring at the roost. So basically, this antenna here will read the, the sensors as the bats are flying both in, whoo, that bats are flying both in and out of the roost. Try this again. There we are. Uh, and so this gives us an unprecedented window, window into daily patterns, but also seasonal patterns and between roost patterns. So bats that are moving from one spot in the hill country to another spot, we understand how they're moving around better. And that helps us better target our interventions in the future. Or maybe we find that some of those bats that I pointed to in North Texas are coming down here here being Caldwell County and uh, collecting, getting infected down here and maybe taking it back up north. So we're just trying to understand what they're up to and where they go. And that really can help reveal some of the things that were, uh, some of the efforts that we're going to make on, on intervention. And this is a picture of a bat. I just have to put one in there because they're nice and, you know, whoop. And, um, you know, they don't really like having pit tags put in them, but it actually does not really cause them much of an impact. So don't worry. When professionals do it, they're, they're, they're largely okay. Uh, and from this, we can gather, um, we can gather this, uh, these kinds of cool hibernation phenological data, and we can look at activity relative to body mass, sex, weather, season, and uh, basically, this is what the data look like. Bats coming in and out of a cave up in the up in the panhandle. Um, in this case, look at this. If we do it by mass, you see this in this this negative trend at the beginning, where fat bats are going into hibernation longer, earlier than skinny bats. Basically, saying if you're fat, you go in earlier. If you're skinny, you go in later. We all would probably assume that. But it's really cool to confirm that and understanding body mass. Body mass is one of the best predictors for uh, white nose impacts. So if we understand how much mass bats are taking into hibernation, we can then work on our ideas uh, on on treatments, best interventions. Can we fatten bats up? Can we do anything to to help them in the future? But basically, this is the kind of information that we need and we don't get when we can't spend all of our time at the caves. So this is very exciting. And with these data, like I said, we can optimize our disease surveillance, which is what's happening right here. This is Fran Hutchins, who I bet you lots of you folks know this guy. Uh, we're working up a cave, in a cave in the panhandle and we're doing disease surveillance work. Uh, we can explore some targeted treatments with these data as well. So, oh, I really like that. 162 bats emerging in blank, Blanco County last night. Interesting. We'll have to talk about that. Anyway, so we can explore some targeted treatments. And now when I talk about treatments, that can be a dirty word to some people in the white nose world. And, <laughs> and uh, we, they're, they're very contentious. Uh, are treatments something that we can do? And there's two schools of thought, maybe even three. People say treatments are not worth anything. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. It impacts the bats in a negative way. Other people say we have to try something. We have to do anything we possibly can. And, you know, there are lots of very valid questions about in this world. When to apply? How do you apply them? Is it effective and is it ethical? The methods are very difficult because bats, we don't know where bats are and we don't know where the majority of bats are. And if you're going into a cave and spraying stuff around, uh, is that the most efficient use of the compound? Is it even effective? And there's lots of testing that has to be done. And this pops up because we want to know if it's ethical. You can't just go into a cave and spray stuff because there are creatures like our beloved Texas cave salamander that will respond badly to the things that, uh, that we're trying to use to, to eliminate the fungus. And so I'll break into this slide real quick just to discuss the epidemiological triad and what our response, how our response is built around this. Um, the disease, diseases are triggered by an interplay of hosts, pathogens, and the environment. You have to have a good environment a susceptible host and the pathogen has to be ready to do a dirty deed. And to fully understand the disease, you have to address these various components. But if you hope to prevent disease and if you hope to buy bats some time, for example, you have to knock out one of these three pillars in the tripod. 
And so one of the techniques that Parks and Wildlife is uh, looking, well, Parks and Wildlife is looking to, to attack each of these three different pillars to uh, potentially do some treatment work. And so I'll just discuss those real quick. We have a, uh, well, with the question also of, you know, should we do this? Uh, what is the cost of doing nothing versus the cost of trying anything? We can have appropriate treatments if we, um, we consider non-sensitive habitats, critical populations, or just using targeted approaches. In, when I put this slide up, this is a highway culvert. It's dirty, it stinks, it's disgusting because it's full of highway effluent. And there really is no natural environment to speak of in there, but the bats love it. And uh, this is one of those cases which I would say, here we have a non-sensitive habitat this is a critical population of bats, and we can take a targeted approach. And so we have launched into a little bit of, of work on uh, doing treatments in highway culverts. We have three approaches, and these approaches basically get at treating uh, the three pillars I was talking about, and get at treating the environment and destroying the pathogen. One of them is polyethylene glycol, which we call PEG. One is a volatile organic compound. And then later on, I'll talk about an experimental vaccine that we're working on with other people. And so PEG is a uh, fungistatic. It keeps the fungus from growing. The volatile organic compound is a fungicide, which kills the fungus. So what we do is we go out to these culverts. Everyone looks happy and, and uh, clean at the beginning of this work. And then later on, we come out looking uh, sweaty, defeated, and very, very muddy. Because working in a culvert is very hard because you're basically bent over like this for six hours. And so what we do is we have a backpack sprayer that's full of these compounds or with the VOC, it's done in a little more of a creative way. But basically, we spray these things into the into the culvert. And, in, and uh, examine whether we've had an impact on the uh, on the fungus, the presence of the fungus inside the, the the roost. But at the same time, we have to ask these questions about, you know, can evolution play a more effective role than us going in there, spending time and money, causing disturbance and doing all these things? Will bat behavior, roosting ecology, or roost characteristics uh, have an impact on white nose syndrome effects more than we will? We don't really know. This is going to take some time. But I like to think that the roost characteristics, particularly in these culverts, are very uh, interesting and perhaps discouraging toward uh, the fungus from growing in there. But, you know, evolution can change the way bats hibernate. As I said, it's, it's, it's not a static event. Bats are always changing the way they hibernate. So behavior can change. They're a roosting ecology. They can choose different roosts. That can change too. So these questions play into whether we do these treatments or not. Right now we're in an experimental phase of, is this a good idea? Is this cost effective? And then we'll eventually have to look, decide whether this is a thing we want to do long term. But just to show some evidence that we're not having a negative impact on bats by doing this, when we do our treatments, we see that our pre-treatment counts and our post-treatment counts are basically the same. The bats have or don't respond badly to these to these events. We go in there, we do our work, put the bats, we either take the bats out or leave them in there while we do this, depending on the treatment, and they're fine. So at least we aren't having negative impact. Uh, but we do need to understand whether there is a positive impact. Right now, there is no fungus at these sites in, in the East Texas culverts. It either hasn't gotten there yet, or we're preventing it from invading, or the environment's doing a good job of keeping it out of there. We'll see. So, ongoing project. Is this a success? I don't know. But the environment could be facilitating some protection from white nose syndrome at the same time. Uh, we're now, we're also talking about a very specific targeted treatment that takes advantage of the bat immune system. It's a it's developed by the National Wildlife Health Center out of Madison, Wisconsin. It's a raccoon pox virus that's been modified to uh, express anti-PD uh, compounds in the bat. So it's basically, a, it's, it's a vaccine. You know how vaccines work. In the laboratory, it's been pretty promising. Well, so here's a, a, just an image of the insertions that they do with this, uh, oh, I forget which one goes in there. Uh, that's IGR3 and TK, I don't know, whatever. Basically, they're putting these, these calnexin uh, uh, enzymes or, or proteins into the genome so that the bats are expressing something that will fight off the fungus. In the laboratory, it's been looking rather promising. The controls died more 
more more quickly than the ones that were vaccinated. And we're in the field. In fact, I'll be in the field next week testing this out in sites in North Texas. So this is looking promising, but we have a lot of questions about how this is going to be adequately used in the field. So what's next? And we're getting close to the end of my time here. Sorry, we're going to go a bit over one o'clock. Um, where do we go next from here? Uh, you know, bats are inherently difficult to study and private land issues in Texas exacerbate that for sure. It's very hard to get access. It's very hard to maintain access. And there's a lot of uh, some negative ideas around working with bats. And, you know, when I say things like ESA listing is going to lead to regulations, there's genuine concern about what that means for, for bats, for bats across the state and, and how uh, development and um, landowners will deal with that. Working with bats requires specialized training, equipment, permitting, access, and, and, and networks. Uh, you really need to, you have to have a rabies vaccine. You have to know where you're going. You have to know how to handle a bat. You have to spend money on equipment. You can't just go into caves without taking along a ladder, you know, stuff like that. And then you need permitting, which, you know, if you ask me, can you go handle bats? I'm going to say, well, you know, are you trained to do this? Do you have a reason to want to do that? <laughs> and, you know, you may not get the permits for it. And the bat network is also really valuable and uh, and useful. And you know, in addition to this, the caving networks are very useful. Um, it's not something that people can just jump into. It's not a very open field. And so when I was when I agreed <clears throat> when I agreed to give this talk, one of the things we talked about in our prep session was, you know, let's give the master naturalist something that they can latch onto. How can you help? And you know, I make this case to say, oh boy, you know, it's really hard to help because the network is so specialized, but we're going to go into some things that I would really appreciate from you guys to help us out. Um, one thing and a very positive thing that you can do for us is to make a case for bats. Misinformation of all kinds is really working against conservation across the board, but bats specifically, they don't have rabies. They're not going to fly into your hair. They didn't cause COVID. All of these things out there, you can just easily shoot down and say, look, you know, Bats are actually a critical part of the ecosystem. They're intrinsically wonderful animals. They play a role and, you know, they're not actually that scary. Go to a bridge and look at them. Go try to find an outreach event where people are, are handling bats. And I mean, you know, you could go to Houston and ask some of our urban biologists to show you around. Um, there's possibilities out there. You just have to ask for them. And then that can be outreach materials for people talking to you. Talk to your neighbors, tell them that bats are great. And then everyone will start talking about it and, and providing more feedback to Parks and Wildlife so we can do something with that information. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest things you can do. It may be unsatisfying, but it really does, does help you dive into some research and be that annoying guy at the party saying, did you know this about bats? They're really cool. I think it's fun. Uh, we can also all work together to maintain and support pristine habitats. You can donate or volunteer to your habitat restoration or preservation groups. In Texas, a really big thing that Parks and Wildlife is up to is uh, land acquisition. Well, we're not really big into it. When we have the opportunity, land acquisition is something that we like to do and getting landowner uh, help. So um, landowner incentive programs and doing tax breaks for, for landowners, basically getting this information out there and helping to facilitate uh, helping to facilitate these kinds of activities that prevent habitats from getting mowed down and turned into housing developments, for, prevent caves from getting used for cheese development. I, I, I had a beer the other day that was a, uh, it was a cave aged ale. And okay, cool. That's that's neat. I, I appreciate that. But also, caves aren't meant to be used for humans as a by humans as a refrigerator. They're pristine habitats, and you know when they're undisturbed, these really cool kinds of things. Or this seed that got washed into a cave was trying to grow. It's totally dark. That plant's dead. But it's a beautiful example of there's a lot of stuff in there that uh, is protected, and caves really benefit from being left alone. So. This kind of information, this kind of effort is really valuable. Um, you can also participate in the monitoring programs. As I mentioned earlier, NABAT will accept data from all sources, provided that you meet the protocol requirements. All data are useful. Even if the data aren't being specifically used, they're, they're very useful. So I really encourage every chapter to either spend 
some time one day going through an NABAT, um, going through the NABAT website, or taking NABAT trainings or participating in NABAT webinars. All of those things are available on their website, like bat mon uh, NABATmonitoring.org, something like that. I, I should have put it in here, but you, know, you can't click on it, so what's the use? But if you just Google North American Bat Monitoring Program, you'll get there and you can see all the stuff that I'm talking about. Um, you know, there is some specialty, there's some specializations required in looking at calls and making sure your data are, are quality, but there's ways to get into this. And I trust that master naturalists know how to do this kind of stuff. Um, and just to summarize here, I want to say that, you know, bats are at risk. Uh, there's lots of things coming and lots of things currently happening that puts bats in a hard spot and it makes jobs like mine difficult, but also rewarding if we can make things work out. We're uh, Parks and Wildlife, we're in the middle of several projects and starting new ones all the time to understand the nature of bats in Texas, where they are, where they go, what they do, what threats are, 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 are looming, and what we can do about it. And our ability to understand bats more will depend on public support and participation. So the more that we have groups like yours telling people that bats are great and telling people that Parks and Wildlife is, is doing more good stuff for bats will really help us out. So keep your eyes open and, you know, tell us everything you can about bats in your area, even if it's sad, even if there's dead bats, you know, because the outcome, the, 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 the consequences of threats to bats are real. We have Endangered Species Act listings in, in process. And these, these kinds of regulations will have impact on infrastructure, power generation, housing developments, that kind of thing. And, you know, of course, like, not all of these things are bad. There needs to be a balance between human development and, and, and nature. We really need to make sure that we preserve nature as much as we possibly can while making sure that we have an equitable society. And so um, I used to work in the Northeast and there are a lot of regulations that go into uh, dealing with ESA listing. With bats, it's especially difficult because they're so hard to study. So this is something that our leaders need to understand. And so I just want to lead, uh, you know, we talked and we opened up talking about Hamlet and I just close it with talking about Hamlet. Hamlet's last line in the play is the rest is silence. And I really hope that that's not what we experience with bats. We don't want to have a silent night. We don't want bats to be gone from the landscape. We don't want it to be like the end of Hamlet in which we have white nose syndrome researchers, bats themselves, <laughs> agency staff and uh, nature appreciators are all feeling defeated and feeling bowled over by these insurmountable problems that we have. So, uh, you know, it may seem like, and especially because I made it seem a bit gloom and doomy, it may seem like there's difficulty out there and it is, but there's lots of room for people to participate. So, you know, please help us out. Nate, we have a couple questions, a few questions in the chat for you. Okay, um, I'm going to quit. I'm going to stop sharing my slide because it's going to advance into my like other slides, okay. my throwaway slides. So sure. let's do stop sharing. There we are. So kind of starting from the top, we have a few questions, and to summarize, there are a, were a few questions asking about. Um, what attracts bats to wind turbines? <laughs> yeah, so that is. One of the biggest questions in bat biology right now, we do not know. There is a thought that they are attracted to them because they're, uh, they're, they're landscape, they're landmarks on the landscape. So a bat will, uh, they'll be flying around and to a bat, an echolocating bat, a, a turbine looks like a big dead tree. Well, what's a reproductive landmark to a bat? It's a big dead tree. You see these bats get attracted to these large landscape features because they'll all be gathering there. And so if males and females are gathering in the same spot to mate, they'll go toward a turbine and get whacked by them. So that's one idea. There's some people who seem to think that there is, uh, uh, that the, the surface of them looks like water to an echolocating bat. And so bats are, are going over to examine why the hell there's vertical standing water <laughs> hanging out in the landscape or trying to take a drink from it. There's people who think that bats use them, again, as a, as a landmark, but as something where they'll, they'll try to um, put uh, 
they'll try to mark them somehow, or they try to use it as a, like they'll they'll try to defend it as a territory, and again they just get thwack. Something about the feature of a large object in the middle of a field attracts bats. And again, like I said, one of the biggest questions in bat biology right now, and we just don't know the answer. Um, go ahead. Oh. I had a question and I'm kind of jumping through some of the questions um, just you were just recently talking about some of the what can master naturalists do and and using the the NBAT uh, NABAT as a uh, monitoring tool. We had um, uh, a master naturalist say that they currently are making their observations on iNaturalist. Is there a crossover um, between iNaturalist as a resource for citizen science to NABAT? Um, and which is the preferred kind of platform for monitoring? Yeah, so the, the preferred platform, well, it depends on what impact you, you want to have. Uh, so hang on one second. I want to dump this. There's the chat. All right, so this is going to go to the panelists. I don't know if that goes to everybody or not, but, you know, you guys can, this is the website for NA, for NABAT. Um, I'm not sure if NABAT uses iNaturalist. I imagine they might pull some of that information down, but the, the better for having an impact on the broadest sense in the, in the sense of participating in the big program, it's far better to align yourself with NABAT and, uh, and, and get deep into that system because it's based on a uh, standardized method, standardized equipment, standardized analysis. And so everyone's doing everything the same way. And it's also kind of based on this, the, the randomized grid network that I was talking about. So if you go into, if you go with INAT, you've got, you know, everyone's using different methods and, and that kind of stuff. It, the platform for NABAT is actually very usable. Uh, it, uh, lots of changes have been happening over the past year. So it's become a lot more user friendly and I think uh, could be very useful for you to, to, to play with. Plus you can also, Get into your data. You can really dive into things and look at your observ and, and look at the, the observations that you're you're doing and how that contributes to the bigger conversation. In addition to that, I've been told that USGS is working on their own auto vetting software such that you can dump your raw files into it. It'll process it and include it into any of that. So familiarizing yourself with the program, getting involved in it, and building your own projects in there gets you set up for when there is a beta test for something like this, you're there and you're ready to get it. I would just participated actually in a, um, I really, I just participated in a beta test of this backyard bat survey thing that BCI has just launched where you, you get an audio moth and which is a little detector about this big and you put it out, we put it out for a week. They got the data. I just shoved it into my, into my laptop uploaded it to their server, it did all the analysis and dumped it out and said, hey, you have two, <laughs> disappointingly, I had two species of bats flying around my house for a week at the end of October. So those kinds of things are upcoming. And like I said, just getting yourself familiarized with this stuff and getting yourself ready means that when they go live, you can dive in and and, and get going on it. iNaturalist is cool because it's out there, but you know, we have a hard time, and a bat, and Parks and Wildlife, we have a hard time pulling data off of there and using it in our systems. There's a couple of questions about distribution of bats um, in Texas and the United States in the chat. Um, what resource do you recommend for checking the distribution of different uh, bat species, uh, both in Texas, across Texas, and then nationally? <laughs> That's in Texas. There it is. So this is a book written by Lauren Ammerman. It's got beautiful photos in it. And um, it's, you can actually get on, there's a website that goes along with this book. I hope you guys could see it in the video. I know that my audio thing is, is making this a little bit difficult, but there's a, there's a website that goes along with this book that is, I'm trying to find it in here, but basically you can go on that website. You can look at this book comes with, with distribution maps of all these species. And so you can picture book your way through it and I'll tell you a story about them, the etymology behind the naming, the history behind them. It's a pretty good resource for, for bats in the state. Um, otherwise, 
Um, you could try checking out the IUCN. There we go. If you try checking out the IUCN websites, they have uh, ranges and stuff built, built in there too. But that said, all of these ranges, they're probably right-ish, but we really don't know. Excellent. Nate, we've got a bunch more questions. I do realize that it is 1.15. Um, if, you so... want to, uh, if you want to, Mary Pearl, you can, um, if you want to like compile them into an email, and send I'd love to. I'm happy to just pick through them and, and, and answer them. You know, this, okay. like, the questions are the best thing, and I, I think I talked too long, so I owe it to you guys. No, so. you did fantastic. I was going to let our master nationalists know that we we're going to keep recording as much as Nate has to say, um, and then uh, we'll post that to our TMN Tuesday website, and I'm going to drop that link in the chat here in just a second um, so that y'all can return to that TMN Tuesday website for that um that recording but then also for um the questions that we get nate to answer for us um post event as well um nate if it, just to wrap it up um again there's a ton of questions i do want to read this in more too i've got nowhere to be but you know we can okay if, uh, but you know however you want well, to do I'm, well, I'm, let, me, let me let me say two things then um okay. we have one really great quote that I want to read to you from Bob Romero, sweet man, uh, master naturalist in the Gulf Coast chapter. He says, um, even though things are looking very grim, I hope you will wind up witnessing and documenting the resiliency of a of at least some of the species of bats in Texas. Um, and he said, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Um, and then the one of the questions that I, I wanted to know, um, and this is me just being a little selfish and kind of taking some of the questions that other folks are asking um is is what can i do in my own um my, on my own property there's some qu uh, questions in the chat about um is it ethical to put up some bat houses what's the process of putting up bat houses what are the best brands and varieties of bat houses um in in some of these affected areas as sure well? yeah so um so let's start out with just a just gonna throw this out there to, to... I'm not going to be a naysayer. How about that? Bat boxes are not always successful. You can put a bat box out there and you will find that perhaps you have put out a wasp box instead of a bat box. They like to move in. That's the way it is. Um, bats are bats are very attached to known places. They're very and my doorbell just rang. Hang on one second. I have to I have to go check on this. I'll be right back. I promise. Oh, he's amazing. <laughs> for our master nationalists that have hung out with us for just a little while longer, if you do have to go, as we said, we are recording this. So thank you, Nate, for staying with us a little longer. Sorry. Yeah, there was a, a FedEx drop that had to happen. Um, so uh, bat boxes might not work because they bats are attached to places and they have very, it's called fidelity. They have very strong fidelity to spots. So they have like five ish habitats or five ish roosts that they kind of move around between the mothers are attached to one spot all the time. Males are especially transient pups will be transient. It all depends on their energetic needs. So you aren't going to attract caverniculus bats, which that that means cave roosting bats to a bat box, most likely. You might get some male velifer or something like that, but most likely not, because it's not the right habitat for them. However, you can get uh, free-tailed bats, you can get evening bats, big brown bats. Um, there might be some myota species that could be interested, but they're not gonna stay there for very long. Basically, uh, it's it's kind of a crapshoot. You might get bats, you might not. But when you do, it's really exciting because they'll hang out there and they'll 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 be one of their spots that they always go back to. The best thing you can do is make a uh, a larger version of a bat box. So a lot of these that they sell are sort of three chamber bat boxes. They're about this this wide. I would recommend a five chamber bat box because it provides a more thermal gradient, a, a, a different th more more thermal options for them to be able to passively thermoregulate and move around. That's very important. Um, the, the bat box should be put up 
on a pole or on the side of the house or something at least they say 18 feet off the ground you can do whatever you want but it needs to be up it needs to be in the sun so it can get warm and don't paint it black whatever you do because black in texas yes it'll get warm in march but when it's july when the pups are out it will get too hot so it's like a brownish color or a beigeish color is what you want to paint it you want to paint it because they'll help steal the wood. Um, one thing that we run into a lot during the summer, I get a lot of emails from people saying that there's dead bats on the ground, and it's usually due to it's usually following a, a period of it getting really hot. You know, the first day that it's 100 degrees down here, you'll have dead bats on the ground because mothers are choosing these places that are warm. They're usually in houses. They choose these environments that are warm in the spring. They have their pups there and then it gets too hot when the summer comes along. So you want to have this, this bat box, you know, in the sun, but maybe have some afternoon shade if you can find it. Or some sort of creative approach to give it a little bit of thermal, a uh, uh, little bit of thermal venting. Those are who are those of you who are a little more uh, uh, inclined toward the carpentry arts. You could design a bat box. There are designs on the Internet. You can just go find them. You don't have to buy it. You can build it. Uh, you might you might consider a design in which the the box is taller because you'll have warm air at the top and cooler cooler air at the bottom, and you have give them a, a broader gradient to work in. Um, as far as brands go, I mean I don't know I think I used to work for a company called Bat Conservation and Management. They're up in Pennsylvania. They make good bat boxes. Um, you want to make sure that the that the the, the box is sealed. So, you know, you want them to say that they've used caulking or something to keep the keep them the the, the chambers well sealed and not drafty. Um, personally, if I were to do bat box of any nature, I would look up plans and build it myself. And I think that's a great project for master naturalists for Christmas presents or for um, for gifts and, and a way to to educate their neighbors as well. That's right. Um, as well. So with that, Nate, I am looking at the time and I know folks have got to get back to lunch and I, I don't want to keep you from your um, research. So I want to say thank you one more time. We will definitely be sending you these questions um, yeah, so that we can post these to our website and, and the recording again for folks that are still on will be posted to our team and Tuesday website by um, close the business today, if not first thing tomorrow morning, depending on, on how long the Internet takes to to download it. Um, but thank you guys for joining us for our TMN Tuesday. Don't forget our next and our, our last for the 2021 series is on December 14th. Um, I apologize for the incorrect date earlier. And we'll, we'll see you guys back uh, for TMN Tuesday on December 14th. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Nate. Really yep, appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye-bye.